First Chronicles 13. Now let's stand to our feet. We've been sitting for a little while. You're probably already comfortable. Sorry about that. <laughs> you know the story. Let's, it's, it's Sunday night. Let's skip a few verses. Let's start in verse number 5. This is First Chronicles 13, verse 5. So David gathered all Israel together from Shihor of Egypt, even into, unto the entering of Hemath, to bring the ark of God from kirjath Jerim. And David went up and all Israel to Baalah, that is to kirjath Jerim, which belongeth to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God the Lord that dwells between the cherubims, whose name is called, whose name is called on it. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ahio drave the cart. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might, and with singing, and with harps, and with psalteries, and with timbrels, and with cymbals, and with trumpets. And when they came under the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. And David was displeased, because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, wherefore that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you once again for this day. We thank you for this morning, the, the gathering that we had, the songs that have been sung. We thank you for uh, a restful, peaceful afternoon. We thank you for, uh, again, this opportunity to meet around your word. And Father, I pray that you would give me words to speak and that you would keep me from saying anything I should not. Help us to use this time wisely. Help our hearts to be open. Help your word to fall on good ground. And help us to have fruit from what we hear this evening. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The story of David getting the ark back is it's a well-known story. We know about Eli falling off the bench when the Philistines took the ark. He was 98 years old, fell off the bench, died. Um, it, was, it was a sad time in Israel when they lost that ark. But this ark of the covenant was, was the heart of Israel. It was the physical heart of Israel from the time that they were walking through the desert this ark in the tabernacle led them where they were going. It was, God, you read the book of Leviticus, there was all types of, uh, uh, not only imagery w uh, contained in that ark, but rules of how they were supposed to carry the ark. It was a, it was a holy thing. And then when they built the temple, um, they didn't build it yet, but w when they do build the temple, that ark, this ark was the most precious thing that the Israelites had. So David gets, he becomes king. He wants to take this ark back. This ark has been sitting in Kirjath Jerim for 20 years in the house of a guy named Abinadab. And if you read the stories there, the Philistines, remember, they took that ark and uh, they, had some, they had some health issues there. They had to make some golden emeralds, stuff like that. If you read, I think it's 1 Samuel, somewhere in 1 Samuel 6, somewhere around there, like 50,000 people die because they look in the ark. I mean, we're just talking about one guy right now, right? Uzzah. But like 50,000 people died because they were messing around with the ark. The ark was just this, it's just unique thing that Israel was supposed to have in Jerusalem. And David wants to bring it back. He gathers 30,000 people, if you read the whole story, 30,000 people to bring the ark back. Now, if you've ever been to, a, we were just at the Sabres game last week, um, and there, that seat's 20,000. Sabres are an awful hockey team. But it was 20,000 people there, and they start yelling. 20,000 people yelling is a lot of noise. You got 30,000 people just pray. They go get that ark. They're praising the Lord. They, you saw the instruments. They're playing on all these instruments, praising the Lord. They are excited. They're getting this ark back. They're bringing it back to Jerusalem after 20 years. They have it on the cart. This Ahio and Uzzah are brothers, and they're driving the cart, and sort of like the guys in charge. And if you would, with, just think about these couple of guys, right? They're the ones that get to drive the ark. 
you know, you got all these people, but these two guys are the chosen ones to drive the ark. You had to think that there could have been a little bit of, I'm driving the ark, right? I'm, I'm the guy driving the ark back. But whatever the case was, they're driving the ark back. The ark hits a bump in the road. The cart hits a bump in the road, and that ark goes to topple off, and Uzzah reaches back to hold the ark. Again, we kind of mentioned this morning, but just because we're sincere in what we do, just because we think we're doing the right thing doesn't mean that God approves of what we're doing. That's right. Sincerity doesn't count with God. That's right. Obedience counts with God. That's right. And he said, you're not touching that ark. And so God smites Uzzah, kills Uzzah. And can you imagine 30,000 people dancing, praising, playing instruments, excited. I mean, this is, this is like a huge celebration. All of a sudden somebody dies. And I, I probably started from the ark and just this hush kind of came over the whole crowd. you got 30,000 people now standing there like, what? Just what's going on? David probably was close to the ark. He, he comes in and inquires what's going on. God has struck Uzzah dead. David, the Bible says, is displeased. Can you imagine? David now. God, I'm trying to bring back the ark. It hasn't been in Jerusalem for 20 years. I'm bringing it back. We're going to put it where it should be. We're going to, I mean, it, it wasn't like they were bringing it in the middle of the night. We, we made a big ordeal out of this. Uh, they, were, they were doing sacrifices. They were singing songs. They had a special, huge celebration. They were trying to do everything that they thought they should be doing, and God still struck us a dead. And it's a, it's, it's a strange, it's sort of a strange story. But when I looked into the story, something really spoke to me. I just want to, I want to share it with you this evening. Look at 2 Samuel. It's the same story, but 2 Samuel chapter 6. And look at verse number 3. This is 2 Samuel 6, 3. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. These weren't just a couple of random guys driving this cart. These two guys, I don't know how old they were, but they grew up with the ark of God in their house. Now, I don't know if it was kept in storage, you know, outside, or I'm sure it had a special place, but can you imagine... You know, they, they had it because of all the problems it was causing with other people, groups, and stuff. People knew it was special. I mean, people knew there was something there. Ahio and Uzzah grew up around that ark for 20 years. First Samuel chapter 7 talks about it was there for 20 years. And this, this says to me that, they, that Uzzah and Ahio at some point became so familiar with the ark of God that they took it for granted. They became so familiar with that ark being in their backyard or in the shed or wherever it was in, the, in a special room in the house that they took for granted the power in that ark. They took for granted what the history of that ark. And they became flippant about it. They, they, God's laws didn't, didn't, didn't mean anything to them anymore. They knew what was best. And out of familiarity or out of whatever it was, when they took that cart and started towards Jerusalem, they thought that they were above the law of God. Now, I, I told you a little bit of our uh, testimony this morning. I don't know if you've been in this church for a week or 10 years or 50 years. Pastor told me this afternoon, I know this church has a long and illustrious history. And I want to warn myself and my family and you good people, not to take what we have for granted. This is what they did. This is what Ohio and Uzzah did. They took it for granted. First, they took for granted the history of that ark. They took it for granted. That, that ark that had, that had traveled through the desert, that ark that, had, that, that ark that crossed the Jordan River and split the Jordan River open, that ark that was in the tabernacle where they, they you can read in the, in the Pentateuch how they would set up the tabernacle and take down the tabernacle. Everything was, everything was around the tabernacle and the tribes were around the tabernacle. It was the tabernacle and inside that tabernacle was the ark. All that history, all, that, uh, uh, all the miracles that God did with that ark, Uzzah and Ohio, just 
they got used to it. They started to take it for granted. They put it all aside and tried to supersede the laws of God. And just once in a while, we have to have a reset and just understand we, we can't take our history for granted. So many times I'm, we would travel back in the day. This is my last sermon to preach in English for a long time. I've preached like 3,000 sermons in Bulgarian and about a, only about 1,000 in English. But we would be in the States for a week or here or there, six weeks here or there, and I'd be like, the pastor would be preaching, and I, and I would say to myself, oh, man, I got you know, the, the week off or the service off. I could sit with my family and, and sit back. And, and more times than should have been, I sat there and said to myself, how can somebody make something so alive seem so boring? I remember I had a, a guy in Bible college. I'm not saying I'm making the Word of God great, but the Word of God is full of, it's alive. I had this Bible teacher, and he, when he preached, he'd come out and he'd, he'd you know, everybody stand up and clap. We, I used to sit down here in the front row of the amen section. So everybody stand up. It doesn't matter who was preaching. Like, I don't know why we're standing up and clapping, but we're standing up and clapping for whatever. And he would come up, and he'd hold the Bible like this. And he'd look at it, and he'd go like this. It's alive. It's breathing. Because this is a, an alive book. It's a, it's a book that changes life, lives. It's a book that can take somebody like my dad who is stuck in the rut of the world and make them a preacher. That, that's the kind of book this is. You can read the stories all over the place how God has changed people through his word. That's the book we have. That's the history of this book. And you know what we tend to do? Especially if we've grown up in church, we take it for granted. We take it for granted. A lot, of, a lot of first generation Christians, man, my dad, when he got in church, he was on fire and he's serving the Lord and driving the bus and they're on Saturday out for, you know, visitation and we we're the first ones there, last ones to go. My daddy, because we were there so often, he bought a house because he was the business owner, just like, okay, forget this house, let's go live by the church. The problem was the church was renting a storefront and moved six months later to like 40 minutes the other direction. But, I mean, he was just, he was all in excited about it. He was first generation Christian. I mean, he, he, his life had been sitting in bars. His life had been waking up with needles in his arms. His, wife, his life had been a mess, and God had taken him out of that miry clay, set his feet on a rock. You know, it was, it, was, it was to be expected that he was excited about this new life. God put their marriage back together. My third brother was born on the one-year anniversary of my parents coming back together, August 18, 1983. And God gave them five more children after that. I mean, totally changed their lives. I can understand a first generation Christian being excited about the Lord, but I was brought up in church. And I've been seeing people, the choir sing and the choir specials and singing the same songs and, and seeing people say, seeing people baptize, and you see it over and over and over and over and over again. You're singing the same songs over and over and over again. And the danger is we take it for granted. Yes. We take our history for granted. Not only that, they took the, I, think they, I think those boys, and I think this is a, a, a danger that we have, we take the blessings for granted. We take the blessings of God for granted. I mean, the big blessings, little blessings, we take it for granted. I remember one time we were in Turkey on one of those trips, and I was with the, that author of that book, Winning Muslims for Christ, and his favorite drink is Pepsi, and it was hot. I mean, Turkey's hot. It was just hot. I think I, it was, what boys were with me? The one slapping five right now. Okay. Santino and Vito were with me. And they were little guys. And we're walking down this hot road. We did public transportation everywhere. And so we're down there just walking. And, and, and we were in the city of Bursa, which is, I mean, you ever heard of Bursa? It's like two million people. It's this huge city on the Marmara Sea without a church. And so we're, we're walking up this, like incline this road, 95 degrees, and um, I don't know if one of the boys said or somebody's like, you know, I'm thirsty, or, or what, or maybe Mark said he's like, what I what I wouldn't do for a Pepsi or something like that, and I all I did was, Lord, can you give us something to drink? I have witnesses. <laughs> Lord, can you give us something to drink? This little scooter comes putting by, put 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 put, put Domino's. It's a Domino's delivery scooter. We didn't have Domino's in Bulgaria for so many years, but we have Domino's now. But it was a Domino's delivery scooter. He comes around the corner and he starts going up the hill in front of us. He gets about, I don't know, 30 yards past us 
and a two liter of Pepsi falls off the back of his scooter and rolls out. We're watching. We're standing there watching this go on. It comes rolling, and we knew what was going to happen because it rolled all the way down, turned, and rolled right to my foot on the curb. And we picked it up and drank it. I mean, that's what the Lord does. I mean, that, that's like, he does that for all of us. If you're a child of God, I mean, that's a little extreme, but he does that kind of stuff for his children because fathers do that for their children. They love their children. They do that for their children. And I think sometimes we take that for granted. We take for granted. You know what a blessing it is to sing the songs of the Lord in church? You know how many times I sat in Bulgaria, I sit in a church in the States, and I think to myself, there's 99% of Bulgarians will never one time sit in a service and hear the praises of the Lord's song. Not one time. They will live and die and go to hell without ever one time sitting in a service like this. We sat in a service last Sunday morning in a little country church. I'm talking about little country church. There was less people there than I think are here right now Sunday morning. Way out in the sticks in New York. And the pastor would ask me for a song. We sang, And Can It Be. Okay, it's 9.30 in the morning. You know, this, the singing does get better throughout the day. Who wants this? You can, those words are so rich in And Can It Be. You can't really comprehend it. Like, our minds are still foggy. We just got to church, and so we sang through the first verse, and we sang through the second verse. They, they had the four-verse ver- version where that second verse, you have to be a professional, you know, like English lit major in order to be able to sing the song correctly. And, but then as we sang, it just started to build, just congregational song, just started to build. And we sang that third verse. And then we sang No Condemnation. We sang, I, how many times have we sung that song? We sing that song all the time in our churches. But God met with us when we sang that song. And it was just, and you've been there, you've had those, it's just the Lord just like there for that song. And 95% of the world will never be in one service and hear a song like that. The blessings. The blessing of, of being in a place. Look at Are there bad apples? Yes. Are there people taking advantage of other people? Yes. But the blessing of being in a place where you have a pastor that loves you, you have brothers and sisters in Christ that care about you. Now, is there stabbing in the back that goes on? Yes. Is the whole New Testament geared toward getting along with each other? Yes. But to, to have a place where you can go where you're not worried about somebody, you know, stealing your purse or, you know, or, or, or it's just, we live like that. Like every week, every Sunday you can be here, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and I'm sure you have other meetings. And we, we, sometimes we take that for granted. The blessings of God, salvation, we take it for granted. We start focusing on all the issues. Well, gas is expensive. Well, you know, gas is expensive in every country in the world. Like, everybody complains about it. doesn't matter where you are. doesn't matter what it costs. It's the Gentile way of thinking. Oh, man. It's the Gentile way of thinking. Matthew 6 says, let them worry about what they're going to wear, what they're going to eat. That's what the Gentiles do. I am your father. I take care of the sparrows. I take care of the flowers. I will take care of you. Seek ye first my kingdom and my righteousness. I'll add all these things unto you. Every country in the world, we Christians should not be the complaining people. And I know, look, we all were made out of flesh. We all you know, complain about whatever. But... Gas at three eighty a gallon, which it was in New York, I filled up once for three eighty, is still half the price that we're paying in Bulgaria, and I'm doing cartwheels in the gas station parking lot because it only cost me hundred twenty dollars to fill up the tank. In Bulgaria, it cost me two hundred fifty dollars. Why? Because we're wired that way to complain. We make ten times more money than them. Gas is half the price, and we're still complaining. Yeah, that's right. Because that's our flesh. And God says, look, I got all that. I'll take care of you. I don't want you complain like everything else. I, his blessings, we can't even count them all. They're all over us every day. His mercies, the, the, unseal, the, 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 the blessings we can't see, the intangible blessings, they're everywhere around us. And we get so focused on, we, we allow the, the technology of this world and the cares of this world and the busyness of this world to squeeze 
out the understanding and the, uh, the acknowledgement of his blessings on our life. We're blessed people. We're blessed people. Do we go through tough times? Just like the world does. Do we go through sickness? Just like the world does. The percentage of people that have cancer in a, in a church or that have leukemia in a, in a church is the exact same as people that don't. The people that die in car accidents is the exact same percentage of the people that aren't in church as the people are, that are in church. The problems of this world, the, uh, the issues that, that are so important to us in this world are the exact same. But we have a God that cares about us. We have a Father that cares about us. And that's the difference between being a child of God and being unsaved. We don't have anything to complain about. And these, these people got, they, they, these, this couple of boys, they took for granted the blessings of God. Lastly, they took for granted the holiness of God. And that's a, that's a danger for us as Christians, to take for granted the holiness of God. God is love, but God is holy. And Uzzah took it for granted. He's like, I got that. I, we can't let the ark fall. And in his justification of protecting the ark because it was holy, he disobeyed God, and God killed him because he, he broke that rule. He broke that law. And we, we cannot, as Christians, take for granted. This is the battle that every church must fight, that every pastor must fight. The wolves that are coming in is this battle to keep the church the pillar and ground of the truth, to keep out the leaven, to keep out the wolves. The goal of a church is not to bring the world in. It's to be a light to the world, to lift up Jesus Christ, and, draw, and, and he'll draw people to himself. But our, our job is not to build a class. It's to preach Jesus Christ. Our job is not to build a church. It's to preach Jesus Christ. Our job is not to get more people to do this or get more people to do that. No, it's to preach Jesus Christ. It's to keep holy what is holy. And everything in this world, I mean, you see it, right? You turn on television, you see it. Everything in this world is attacking holiness. You got, you, you um, people that are married, you watch. You, that one little crack in your marriage, you better... You better get the Holy Spirit in there to fix that crack in your marriage because the enemy is an expert at hitting that crack to break up that marriage. That's what he does. Why? Because marriage is holy. It's not holy anymore. It's holy to God. Yes, sir. It's holy to God. It shows. It's a, it's a, it's a symbol of Jesus Christ's love for the church. That, that's what marriage is. It's, it's bigger than us. It transcends any one person or one family. It's not about you and being in love. Marriage is not about you and being in love. Marriage is about the symbol of Jesus Christ loving the church. And the wife being in subjection to the husband is a symbol of the church being in subjection to God. It's holy. Marriage is holy. That's why you shouldn't mess around with your marriage. You shouldn't take that for granted. Take it flippantly. Why? Because it's holy. These guys took it for granted. It's not holy. Children are, are holy. That's a blessing from God. Well, I, I think I'll, everybody's having two kids now. I think I'll have two kids. I'm not, and I'm not saying how many kids you should have. But what, what, why not let it be a holy thing? Yes. Not a, well, this is what I want to do. This drives me crazy. Oh, a six-year-old. What do you want to do when you grow up? Look, you can ask somebody out in the world that, but we're bought with a price. There's only one answer. Whatever God wants me to do. Right. You don't have a right to answer that question. If you're saved, right. that's not a question you, you have a right to have. Stop asking 12-year-olds what they're going to do when they grow up. And if you do, the answer 12-year-old should be whatever God wants me to do. If you're saved because you're bought with a price, you are not your own. God owns us. He's our Father. He tells us what He wants us to do. But we live in a society that's it's all about us, right? It's all, oh, i got to take care of this, and I need to make sure this is taken care of, and what's going to happen there. And, th and, well, that's, like I said this morning, well, that's too dangerous, and that's too, well, that's too risky. Well, what about God? Raising children is a holy calling. It's not the government's job. It's not your mother-in-law's job. It's not a babysitter's job. It's your job. It's a holy calling. It's become commonplace now. It's become, well, my kids, I send them up there, I send them up there. You know, I come home from work. Look it, I'm, 
I know times are tough. It's, it's tougher in Bulgaria. I know. Every mother has to work in Bulgaria. Every single one. Even if the husband works. Everybody's working. But that doesn't make it right. And you fathers are the ones supposed to be training your kids, not the mothers. This is why God won't let me be a pastor in America, because I'd have like three people in a church. The job of training the children is on the father's head. Not on the mother's head. The elder women should teach the younger women to love their husbands, not to teach a Sunday school class or to run a ladies' conference. If we have a ladies' conference, have a, have a man of God come in and preach a ladies' conference. I don't know if you guys do or not, but why, why don't we get back to the, the things that are holy? Why don't we make them holy again? We have our own set of what we think is holy. Like the Christmas program, don't touch that. That's holy. I mean, that is what the whole year is geared around. The Christmas program. I'm not against Christmas programs, but that's holy, not holy, who knows? Raising children is holy. That's a holy thing that sometimes we take for granted. There's a whole bunch of stuff we can get to, but the just one more. The church is holy. The church is a holy thing. It's not just, well, that's the place I go, or that's the place, you know, I'm comfortable there, or I'm going to find a place where they have a good program for my kids. You better find a church, and you have, but church is a place where you get doctrine and where you become part of a body that functions together to serve Christ. And that, it's a holy thing. Well, I, you know, I think I'm, I think I'm sick today. You know, I, I sniffed four times. I don't want to give everybody pneumonia. I better stay home, you know. And I, I mentioned this morning. COVID, what? Are you kidding me? Look, if you, if you are elderly or sickly or something like that, of course, stay home. If you, have, if, you have, if you really do have tuberculosis, please stay home. You know, don't come to church. Don't be stupid. But we're looking for excuses to not come to church. We're looking for excuses not to be involved in church. And the church is this holy thing. Read Acts. This is what God gave his blood for. Yes. It's for the church. Modern Christianity has made it all about the individual. It's all about you. And you've got to have self-esteem. And God loves you. And he does love you. But he gave his blood for the church. And this is not just a meeting. This is not just convenient this evening. This is the church called out, assembling together. And it's holy. Amen. And it's holy. And we've got to be careful not to take these things for granted that, that we've had for so long and that we possess just like a high and So I have to, I'm going to, I'm going to shut her down, but I'm going to tell you just one quick story. I've only given it a couple times. But just the Lord worked in my life. When I was 16, I told you this morning, when I was 16, I started walking with God. And that's a biblical phrase, to walk with God. If you, you read about Enoch, he walked with God. Uh, God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. I mean, these are, the, these are like the first people on earth, okay? Uh, Micah 6, 8. What, what's the whole duty of man? To, to, do, to do justly. To love mercy. And to walk humbly with thy God. He said, that, that, that's, that's your job. That, that's what I want you to do. Of course, that doesn't ex, you know, that's not excluding all this stuff. Serving God. But that, that is who we should be. Just walk with God. Just be with him. Just kind of be in meditation. Just be with him. We don't have to be talking every second. You know, when you're spending time with your wife, you don't have to be talking every second to be with her. Sometimes you just go and you just sit on a beach. Well, if you're a Baptist, you don't. Know, but you go sit at a cafe. Well, no, that's Europeans. What do you do in America? What do couples do? We've been married over in Europe. What do couples do here? You just, you're just with each other playing Nintendo? I don't know. <laughs> on the porch, yes. On the porch looking over the land as the sun sets. Just to, you just, you're, you just want to be with that person. You, you just love to be with that person. You don't have to be, you don't come with a list of stuff. Okay, I love you, honey, and can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this for me? Look at Obviously, God wants us to come boldly to his throne. But don't you think that God may just want to spend time with us sometimes? Just, just be with me. Look, life's busy. The busier life is, the more you can show God how much you love him by taking time just to be with him. Yes, well, God's always with me. Okay, use that cop out. I know he's always with us. But you can take an hour. If you're, if you're serving God, if you're going to be in full-time ministry, I think an hour is a good starting point. Could you not watch with me one hour? 
Jesus said to Peter, James, and John, can you give me one hour? Just be with God. When I was 16, I just started to be with God. I'm not, I wasn't a great Christian. I'm not a great Christian, but I just walked with God. And it was something that it, it kind of grew in me. And I always had a place. I'd go outside. I, was, I didn't want to talk to my parents about my walk with God. It was embarrassing. I would go out. There was a bunch of kids running around anyway, I like seven younger brothers and sisters. So I'd go out. We lived in New York, cornfield, just walk around a cornfield. And I had a spot in college. I had a spot to fight for that because, you know, just crazy stuff in college, being in college and then working a full-time job and getting four hours of sleep a night for five years in a row. Ridiculous. Like, that's not biblical either. But, uh, but I had to fight for that. I had my spot, walk with God, walk with God. Moved to the mission field, and, like, God was the one that was there. I mean, he was the one with us and had my spot there in the park and just walk with God, walk with God. We've been on the mission field now. It was, this happened a couple of years ago, maybe two years ago. And through the years, we've had family altar, whatever you want to call it, family devotions. We've had several different types over the years. You know, it's not like, I'm just not, we're just not good at doing the same thing all the time. We just change up here and there, and we'll go do different things. But we had started the school year a couple years ago. It was probably October. And our family altar was at, we moved it to 8 o'clock in the morning. And usually I would go out before that. I'd go out before 8, and I'd, be, I'd come home you know, after that. But all the kids, we'd gather them up, and we, we'd read the Bible. We'd sing. We'd go through the songbook, just every song in the songbook, try to learn the new songs, songs we don't know, instead of singing the same 25 songs that I grew up with, try to learn the songs. We'd get out the instruments. We'd sing. We'd read the Bible. Uh, this year, we, we read through the Bible in about 25 days, just, just us just reading through the Bible, um, and then we pray. We have three, four, five people pray. We're all there. It was a great time. And we would, we're not sticklers. My wife has a little bit of German blood, and I have some German blood. But if we go over, we're supposed to start school at 9. If we went over to 9.05 or 9.10 or 9.15 or 9.30, it didn't matter because we're with the Lord, right? It just, it was a great time. We did that for a couple months. But my, my walk with the Lord was growing cold. My walk with the Lord is... Has always, whether I'm far away from him or close to him, it was always burning in me. And I got to the point where I got a little complacent. Doing something good, saving the ark from falling. And I'm sitting and laying in bed one night. I got up and I had this pain in my back. I don't know what it was. People say that that's what a kidney stone feels like. I don't know. I never passed one and nothing ever came of it after, afterwards. But I had this pain. I couldn't get up. And, you know, I'm a typical, I'm the, like the old-fashioned males. I don't know, in the last 20 years, something's happened here. But we don't go to the doctors. Like, it's got to be like, a, like I got to be holding my foot in my hand and have somebody, like, tape it back on at the hospital in order to go. I, we don't go. We've been there 20 years. We've been there, like, three times. So we have all boys, broken bones, all that kind of stuff. We don't go to the doctors. We don't have a GP. I learned that term also coming back. GP, what is a GP? But we don't have a GP. So nobody will look at us anymore because we don't have a GP. But I'm like, Katie's like, you need to go to the doctor's like two in the morning during COVID. During COVID. I'm like, I need to go. I couldn't drive. We, had a, we called a taxi, drove me down like two in the morning. And, and they shot me up with something. I went home. It was probably 3, 3.30. And I just was walking around the house. I'm like, God help me. I didn't know what it was. God help me. God help me. What is this? God, God help me. And it would come in, in waves, and I would just like fall on the floor and just be, I, I couldn't bear the pain. Finally, I told Katie, I, I was just like sitting there, in fr laying there in front of the, um, of the fireplace. There's some granite there. It was a little bit cooler. And just like in a fetal position, I'm like, just go upstairs. She's looking at me and crying and stuff. Just go upstairs. What, what are we going to do? There's nothing we can do. This is, this is the way it is. And I'm just laying there for hours. And like 7 o'clock, I had been saying, God, help me. God, God, what is this? God, help me. God, what is this? At 7 o'clock, I'm laying there. And I just lifted up my arm. And I said, I, I opened up my eyes. I said, Father, it's Nick. And the pain went away. And I'm laying there. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, did I move? Like, am I in a position now where the pain's gone? I didn't want to move. I lowered my arm and I just laid there for probably half an hour, 45 minutes. No pain. And I have no charismatic blood at all. I'm just waiting. I, I slowly got up. I sat down. I didn't tell Katie. 
because I didn't want to jinx it, you know. <laughs> that morning went by, the rest of the morning went by. That whole day went by. I didn't get the courage to tell her until the next night. But after I just reconnected, and he showed me exactly why, that was why, it was the chastening of the Lord. Just, okay, you're taking care of your family, but don't forget about me. Don't forget about me in your excitement to do something good. You better not forget about God. And I knew exactly what I needed. And he slapped me upside the head and brought me back to my walk with God. That's all I'm saying tonight. Don't take it for granted. You're doing right. Look, you're at church on Sunday night. You could be watching, a, you could be watching the Bills game. You could be doing something else. I'm sure everybody in here is busy. Nobody's sitting at home twiddling their thumbs. You're at church. You're good people. As far as what, compared to the world, you know, I'm sure, well, I don't know. I'm not going to say what you may or may not be doing. But your heart is in the right spot. But it doesn't matter if you forget what's most important. Don't take it for granted. Us in Ohio, they grew up with that ark. They took it for granted. You're in a great place. Great pastor. Great music. Great doctrine, which is the most important thing. I should have said that first. The doctrine's right. You have the Bible. You have a God that loves you. You have people that love you. Don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted in doing something that you think is right to do. I have to stop. Let's stand to our feet. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. I don't know how long you've been saved. I don't know. You may be a Sunday school teacher. You may be in this church. You may have been in this church for the last 50 years. You may be new. I don't know. But I know human nature. And I know the flesh is always vying for position and for power in our lives. And that for some reason, maybe it's just one person. Again, it's just, this is God's business here. But there may be somebody here, you're doing the right things, you're teaching Sunday school, you're, people look at you and they say, if they looked at you, they would say, that, that man is a man of God. That woman is doing the right stuff. I mean, she's, she's an upstanding Christian. But you know in your heart that there's something missing that should be there. Nobody else can see it because we can hide it. And God's calling you back this evening. Why don't, why don't we come back to God before he has to hit us over in the head with a baseball bat? Why don't we come back to God before he has to chase us? Because he will. If you are his, he will chasten you. Because he loves you. And he's trying to remind somebody tonight. Look, I don't want to put you through something, so just come back to me on your own. Father, I pray that you'd be with the invitation. I pray that our hearts would be soft. I pray that you would explain more thoroughly what you want, better than I can, and that you would bring that one that is far away back that our hearts would burn within us to be with you, to be with you this evening, tomorrow morning, throughout this week, to have that walk with you, to walk humbly with our God. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Piano's playing, the altar's open, some have already come, the message has been given. Every person in this room, every child of God, there's going to be seasons, maybe you're not right now, but there's many people here tonight, there's probably somebody that has, we've, we've taken it for granted very easy second third generation many second third generation Christians in this church second generation Christians in this church they're in their 60s when you've been saved from a life of sin as opposed to out of it it's it's even easier we can be thankful that we have a God that loves us enough to remind us who will awaken us make sure that our relationship with him is real, that it's sincere, that it's true.